Foundation Open Unit. Tonight's speaker is Ron Hazelden, who's uh, an artist who is probably best known for working in sound and light and using activated mechanisms to alter one's perception of places. I first came across Ron when he was the senior scholar at the British School at Rome, and I was intrigued by his studio, which was full of wires and pliers and soldering irons, and I wondered what sort of thing he would produce. The first thing I saw was a, something called a yodeling book, which was a book that came to life in the somber surroundings of the school library, <coughs> a book that burst into life, activated by the presence of people, a book that started uh, playing the sound of yodeling and having sequenced red light-emitting diodes. Ron, as well as working with objects that can be transported from place to place and uh, alter their settings through their activities, um, has started working on a much larger scale, almost an urban scale, using light and sound installations. Um, the lecture tonight is called Feeding the Tamagotchi. Ron. Thank you, David. Um, what time do you want me to finish? <laughs> to an hour, I think. An hour? Maybe some questions, if, okay. if you're willing. Okay. Um, well, nice to see you all here this evening. Can you hear me? Um, I uh, so, thank you, David. That was great. Um, <laughs> we met in Rome, and um, we had a very nice time there, really, didn't we? We did a lot of things, yes. Um, a very energetic place, Rome, but uh, we won't go on about that now. It, uh, every location seems to uh, throw up a um, different set of ideas and um, I think artists have this uh, fantastic um, possibility of travelling and um, making work in uh, different locations and different cultural settings and um, I think I try and capitalise on that. Um, I teach two days a week at the University of Reading in the Department of Fine Art and um, our good friend Joel was uh, one of my students and uh, so you'll see the quality of teaching that goes on at Reading University. Um, I, uh, I work in, uh, have a, a base in London and also a base in France and uh, I think that uh, it's not really too important to have a studio as a sculptor, but rather um, I like to just operate from quite a modest small room in quite a modest small uh, flat in uh, South East London because um, the studio for me becomes, I suppose, the place where things take place and um, a lot of the time is spent on the telephone, the fax machine and filing cabinets and um, a lot of work can be done on uh, railway trains and uh, boat crossings and uh, it isn't my interest to get too involved in going to a studio at nine o'clock in the morning and uh, clocking off at six in the evening um, although I have tried it and it doesn't work for me temperamentally and Today I've been working in Wolverhampton for a, quite a large-scale project that's going to take place um, over the Christmas period and I think of it as a sculpture, other people think of it as the Christmas lights for Wolverhampton. Um, it involves the uh, using the centre of the town and uh, a number of the lamp, lamp posts concentrated in the centre of the town and on each lamp post is a loudspeaker and on uh, each lamp post is a series of lights that step up and down and uh, from the loudspeakers come the sounds of children singing and the children that are singing are local children from the town and as they sing on all these lampposts, you, uh, they activate the lights 
and as the buses and traffic move by, they also activate the, activate the light. So there's a sort of interaction between that ambient sound and the children's sound. And uh, I just got two slides and a little bit of recording that I did this afternoon. Joel, so when you're ready, please. Yes, uh, yes please. This is actually the street plan of Wolverhampton, upside down, but it doesn't really matter. And these are the lampposts, and these are the colours that are going to be used on the lights in, um, in the one, two, three, four streets, and then a concentration of colours in that central area. Sound, please, Joel. It's just a little snippet. <laughs> Turn it up a bit, Joe. Right, take up in your If you think it'll make a difference in the performance of getting standard. I think it will be well. The more like still you know, you can sit down and from around the world and um, as they sing the, there'll be a network of um, speakers with uh, a lot of different channels so the different songs and the lights will activate and move up and down the town centre. Next slide please. Oh I'm doing the slides. I'm sorry about that. Red one did you say Joel? Blue one. Blue one. Thank you. I've got a blank there. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm going to move through quite a lot of images, but I'm going to go quite fast. And uh, this one is the uh, Bruegel painting of the Tower of Babel, which, um, in fact, Bruegel did two paintings of the Tower of Babel, which became just a little light box and um, went to a negative. But this is a sort of image that um, many artists, including myself, have used uh, and continue to use. This work was... Um, something that won a competition uh, about 15 years ago for Holborn Underground Station. It was a competition for artists to come up with an idea for the refurbishment of Holborn Underground Station, which is the biggest underground station in London. And uh, this is the biggest um, escalator shaft. And this is the roof, the treatment that I came up with for the roof of the shaft, which is a light work that this is a model of, and it's a working model. When people come on at the bottom of the escalator shaft, they activate a little line of lights that moves through one of these grids. And it follows them um, up, or if you are coming uh, from the top, you activate a line of lights that follows you down. And the more people that use the underground the more dense the configuration of the grid becomes and in quieter periods the more skeletal it is with your little line of lights moving with you. And um, this was uh, my first serious use of LEDs, light emitting diodes and at that time they hadn't reached the sophistication, level of sophistication, the technology hadn't got to where it is now but um, 
it, uh, the whole project was, although I won this competition, was very rapidly uh, abandoned um, by the London Underground uh, organization, company, whatever it was called then. And um, the government withdrew funding because people felt that this would cost too much and uh, all the rest of it. But nobody really did serious <coughs> research into that. However, a lot of things that I undertake do tend to end up as scripts and sit waiting for the possibility of um, some realization at some time in the future. And the architect who worked with me a little bit on that was uh, David Levitt of Levitt Bernstein. I show in galleries as well as work in outdoor spaces and um, I feel that uh, galleries are interesting and useful where relevant but very often um, they are not perhaps the right uh, location for ideas but this is a, a gallery in Frith Street called the Frith Street Gallery and it was an exhibition of five artists uh, the show was called Illuminated Library and this was one piece of mine which um, is a series of books with little lights suspended in them, tiny, tiny lights and just occasionally at random moments the lights would just flicker through almost like the wind has suddenly disturbed them. Um, so using um, objects that already exist is um, uh, is a sort of priority, I suppose, in my, my thinking, because um, they, uh, I like to overlay or um, just motivate some kind of event that I feel afterwards could, the event could be taken away and everything goes back to where it was before. So I don't feel terribly interested in um, designing things, I like to let the object speak to me and then um, make one move. The more economical the move, usually the more successful the work is. And it interests me when I do work with architects how very rapidly they get their pencils out and they start scribbling and drawing and designing. And I say, hang on, hang on, don't design anything, let's just see what is already there. So uh, that interests me that I have a different kind of motivation. Um, it's another word for it is laziness, really. Um, so this piece, uh, I suppose, illustrates my interest often in sort of minutiae or small, small things, and um, in this case, books. And I did a number of small book works. These books are blanks. They're made before. Uh, production. They're actually destined for, they're designed for a particular novel or whatever, and uh, it's the pre-production pre book. So they're quite beautiful, but there's nothing in them. So I can, I can um, populate them. And these little LEDs, in this case, these LEDs travel. They have a sort of running, a running sequence over, like just tiny little lights just moving across with that little bit of tension with the page and very sort of temporary feel about them. These two, I think, ran in opposite directions, just trickling across on a card table. This one, you couldn't see the LEDs, but it flashed from one side to the other, and uh, they are kind of, the, to me, they were like little figures, because when I take the dogs for a walk in the morning in the local park, I see people doing exercises in the park, doing all strange things like this. So these little LEDs go like that. It's, uh, it does drive you mad if you have to watch it for a long time. We're now on to a yodeling book. I think we have a rather lousy sound system here, I'm afraid. But let's try this one, Joel. I have to explain that when you push a little switch, this music comes and these little speakers and the little lights either side of the book dance up and down as the music uh, plays and this was the, um, the library in the British school at Rome and academics 
who were doing their serious research were um, given these little interludes of uh, relief. You can turn it up a little bit, Charles, if you like, it's quite irritating. found that I sort of re revisit subjects and one of the subjects that uh, often reoccurs is an interest in tree forms and this was a little uh, electronic tree it was made for a touring exhibition called the Tree of Life which started at the um, Festival Hall Southbank Centre and travelled around Britain at various galleries and they are just little lines of uh, light emitting diodes which are suspended in space and they sort of flash, they kind of do a, a kind of movement and then a little serpent, you see the little yellow line occasionally flashes up to the top and flashes back again but all the sort of bits and pieces are left there on the floor and uh, one of uh, our old dogs, Rosie, who's now dead I'm afraid, who loved sitting in front of electric fires would come in when I had this in the in the room and sit in front of it thinking it was an electric fire um, <laughs> That's the thing I remember most about that piece. Um, in the garden in uh, France there are various fruit trees and occasionally I work out there with light pieces and um, it's a nice place to work because our neighbours um, will come along when you invite them to a little sort of private view, vernissage, and you have a little bit of wine and then uh, they're all old people and uh, I switch the lights on and everybody claps and we have a little drinky together and uh, it's very pleasant and then we all go off home and have our evening meals but uh, this is one piece and uh, this is another piece which are um, actually our fruit trees in the garden and this was probably about midnight it's an LED piece which gets a little bit more easily explained as I go on. This photograph was taken about four o'clock in the morning. Um, these trees now have grown quite a lot since this piece of work, but um, they never ever fruit at all. So the energy has gone somewhere. Um, another LED piece that I did in a gallery, it's called the Showroom Gallery, was um, quite a, a kind of architectural piece. This used to be a shop and uh, you saw this piece from the road as you walked by. You didn't go into the gallery and it had a wonderful uh, sort of space that went back in like a sort of funnel configuration and these spheres of light which can't be explained in a slide were um, appeared to whirl around switch very fast and then these little triangles on the floor would occasionally flash down and the space that they occupied appeared to jump um, called Colosseum. One piece from uh, my visit to Rome was a piece called um, Cat's Eyes and um, a series of light works were uh, put around the city in Rome and my site that I was offered was this archaeological site by uh, Teatro di Marcello and I 
put tiny little pairs of red LEDs amongst the ruins. I didn't put the ruins there, they were there. And um, solar panels charged batteries during the day. And at night, the uh, little eyes would light up when the light level dropped automatically. And this piece could just go on and on and on ad infinitum until the electronics wore out. Um, it came really because my wife, who's an artist, Sharon Kivlin, was working with some of the cat colonies that um, exist in amongst these sites, and I'm sure a lot of you know, and she was a sort of voluntary helper. And it is so strange when you see these uh, cats, hundreds of cats, uh, all together in these little colonies on these sites, sitting there in the sun or whatever. So it was a response to that situation. I was asked to do a piece of work in a little East German village, which um, is called Draven, just outside of Berlin. And uh, this was just last year. Um, the, an artist lives in the village and he invites people to, um, artists from all around the world, to come and make works in this small village. And I did a preliminary visit and it's quite obvious from conversations that people in that village are still trying to deal with the consequences of um, uh, being united with West Germany. And, um, there's a village green, this little village green, and I just suddenly um, saw the possibility of doing a horse, a, a sort of work horse, because where I live in Brittany, there are these really fabulous big um, work horses that pull plows and, uh, or used to pull plows, and do the farm, farm work. And um, I sort of, I was quite interested in the way, um, I don't know what I was interested in, really. I saw this bloody big horse there <laughs> and felt it kind of had a connection with the sort of state that existed at that time, a sort of state of tension really. So this horse, I got the image from um, uh, a World of Wonder book. World of Wonder books are very useful um, and it's the biggest horse ever when well, it was recorded in 1930 odd and it weighed over a tonne and a half, and it was owned by an American, and it was an Irish horse. Um, the horse is larger than life-size, so it's sort of colossus scale. And um, it just stands there, and it glows. And at night, using these LEDs, it's, it's quite fierce. Um, it was a temporary work designed to exist for just a couple of months during the show period, but. I was phoned up recently and uh, I was asked, apparently the village people liked it and felt it was uh, quite relevant <coughs> and asked if it could be made into a permanent piece, which is a very nice thing. So it uh, is probably still there. <laughs> but very often I will make works like this and they will travel to other locations and it is, it is my interest to move this horse to uh, another location somewhere else and uh, see, look at the consequences of changing the context. And often the, well usually the context is quite a powerful um, uh, part of uh, the whole sort of thinking that goes behind a piece of work. And this uh, location, for example, is in uh, Lieben, in, uh, which is a suburb of Prague, and it's a disaffected Jewish uh, synagogue. Artists had been al uh, allowed to put on exhibitions here for a, a period of time, and I was involved in a show with uh, three other artists from England, and my piece was called Absent Friends, and on the left, there's the word absent in light, bulb, light bulbs. And on the right, the word uh, friends in light bulbs. And they switch with a road, uh, random sequence. 
So they may go absent, 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 friends, friends, absent, absent, friends, 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 absent, whatever. And uh, so they're always making connections between, um, uh, between themselves. And it was a wonderful place, as you can see, totally untouched. And its history, as you can imagine, was uh, somewhat sad and uh, depressing. But uh, it's one of the few synagogues left in an area of Prague that used to be um, uh, very densely populated. I have been to the uh, Czech Republic quite a lot. And you'll notice I'm saying Czech Republic and not Czechoslovakia. It's only people from the Czech Republic who call it Czechoslovakia. The rest of us call it the Czech Republic, as we're supposed to. Um, this is in a cellar in uh, a disused Baroque monastery, an old, apparently an old beer cellar, but I never found any. Um, the Every year, there's a group of artists that are invited to work within different locations around the monastery. And um, this was my location. And I think I have a tape here, Joel. Uh, the work was called Bees in the Bush. And the soundtrack comes from uh, a musician, experimental musician, sound recordist called Peter Cusack, who uh, has the most fabulous collection of uh, British wildlife recordings. You can put the tape on when you like. Um, so what happens here, it's a very simple piece. These uh, lights are just suspended. And uh, the soundtrack plays. And it fills the... Um, you just leave it going, Joel. You're right. It's a loop. It's a very funny sound, you know like bees are. Um, there are just these two lines of um, light suspended in a very simple cross and as the... That's it. Thank you. Oh, uh, it's skidding, is it? Oh, okay. Very sorry about that. It's one of these ended, endless loops. Well, a little brief burst of it. So, if you can imagine, little angry bees or happy bees, and uh, as the bees vibrate their sound, this piece vibrates, or it holds and it freezes, or it, it vibrates, and it will pick up your sound in the room. So, in a way, this sort of construction is a kind of sound sensor that has a very simple geometric form to it. And um, I think it's simplicity um, is something that I still like about it. Okay, Joe, we won't worry about that one. That's just another view. Um, just going on to another recent summer work in um, Cornwall. I was asked by um, the uh, Tate Gallery and Newlin Art Gallery, um, St. Ives, to participate in a show called A Quality of Light. And a number of artists were given locations around the, that area. And um, the title, A Quality of Light, is a kind of joke in a way because people coming to that, going to that part of the world often speak about. Um, the quality of light and um, also, as you probably know, the tradition of the Cornish painters were always dealing with that quality of light. The work, I was given a fantastic location which was uh, Land's End and I visited Land's End and I stayed in the hotel and I went to the theme park and uh, really quite enjoyed it. And it was there high up on the cliffs overlooking uh, the Atlantic. And in the past, I have actually done a, a voyage across the Atlantic to, uh, to Canada. So when I look at the Atlantic, at that supposedly furthermost point of Britain, I sort of know how big it is and um, 
how long it takes to go over there if you're uh, in a boat. And my work that I, my piece for the uh, for Land's End was just called The Diver. And simply a diver standing at the top of a mast, at the top of the cliff, and he simply dives off. And then he comes back and he dives off. And he comes back and he dives off. And this is a photograph from a little model of it. And he dives. And he does a little spin. And then he disappears. Um, and then the piece was made. But what happened was Land's End Company decided that a diver diving off their cliff didn't suit their image. And uh, after all the press review uh, openings at the Tate Gallery in London and uh, all the rest of it, they wrote us a little quite snotty letter saying, um, we don't think this piece is relevant. So we found another location, which was Hale Harbour which is quite an interesting, but mysterious little uh, harbour town not far from St Ives. And on the day of uh, putting this work up, these figures arrived from France, late, and uh, to my amazement, the French had put trunks on them. Um, Now this did surprise me because I don't associate modesty with the French and um, it also irritated me. <laughs> anyway, they were rushed up and put in position and um, they performed in Hale Harbour. And these shots obviously can't really show you the sequence, their time exposures. But it's, it's quite a beautiful place and the nice thing about it was that everybody in this little town here was really exciting that a piece of sculpture was uh, coming to their town. And they have great plans for an art school to happen in this town, which apparently Barbara Hepworth, who lived nearby, was also very keen on. So if anybody feels that um, they have a vocation in life to go and participate in, the, uh, in a, a new art school for sculpture, that's where to go. This work now exists and is in my barn in France. And if anybody has an enormous house somewhere or an interesting location, we can uh, give it another go. I am hoping that I might be able to get a location in Brittany um, on the cliffs and diving into the Atlantic uh, there. Very often these pieces are able to travel. There was one occasion, one night, where there was a bonfire firework celebration. I can't remember what it was. So a couple of nice pics. Anyway, this is more local. This is down, down in Lewisham, where I live, southeast of London an area which uh, my wife calls poor but honest. And um, it's true. The, uh, I was asked if I would work on the centre, an idea for the centre of the town, which was going to become a pedestrianised area, um, which you may have heard about pedestrianised areas, um, whether I could do something with the existing lights or the lights that were going to come into the town. So my idea was to work with a changing colour field and it, uh, I worked with a series of moving um, cowlings on the tops of the street lights which turned in the wind so that when you walked through the town you would just walk through these different sort of atmospheres depending on um, which way the wind blew. And this was a little model that we made that worked when you, uh, when you put a fan on it. But we developed a prototype and um, started running into some problems and uh, Paul Lewisham got um, 
a bit scared about carrying it through. So this one sits as a script. But um, further on down the road in Lewisham is another building, Lewisham Library, which was a building, I think, probably from the 50s. And uh, they renovated it to become their new library and asked me to do a piece of work there. Nobody seemed to like this building except me. I like the simplicity of it. And to me, it was like a, a book, an open book. And so this uh, idea was to have a wind-directed piece using colour field, changing colour field. And what happens is, as the wind blows, the colours very, very softly change from one side of the building to the other. So, depending on the wind direction, you will get this just gradual moving light work. And during the rush hour, you get a big build-up of traffic in this roundabout here, so you can sit in your car and just look at this softly changing piece of work. The only time the two colours are the same is when the wind's in the north and the whole lot becomes blue. And further on down the road is Peckham. And um, there's a... I was asked to think about a piece of work here from a building that was made by John McCaslam. Uh, Troughton McCaslam architects, as they were then, for a market area in Peckham. And I used the principle of um, it also had to provide the ambient light for people underneath. So I used the principle of the, um, the umbrella that uh, photographers <coughs> use in their studio to bounce light, because um, that was their building, and um, it looked like a sort of umbrella and it had a white interior. So the piece of work is a barometer and um, as the barometric air pressure changes, so the colour on the roof gradually changes. So if you are a local of Peckham and um, you want to know whether it's going to get rainy and windy and horrible or bright and sunny and lovely, you just walk past this at night and um, you can look at a little legend on the side which is illuminated and it will tell you um, because it's, it's, it's pretty accurate. The only thing is, I can't remember what colour means what, but, um, but then I don't live in Peckham, you see. But you could walk up the high street and visit the shop and on your way back, notice that, uh, you know, the barometer's falling. I recently installed a smaller scale work in um, an art centre in Sway, um, near Southampton, Hampshire, Hampshire, yes. And uh, this is just a, like a little signpost that is sequenced by the little wind vane on top. And there are just four words, we wrong are right. And what happens is, as the wind vane turns, it sequences many different combinations. And um, I suppose the location of an arts centre directed my thinking in the... Uh, words that I was using. So it could just keep going right, 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 wrong, right, 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 we are wrong, right, right, wrong, we are whatever. You can imagine the different combinations. And it's controlled by a little microprocessor. And at night it's uh, quite a powerful little uh, piece and there's a pub that you can sit at across the road and uh, stare at, which um, I haven't actually done, but I'm assured it's a very nice thing to do. <laughs> Back to Peckham, 
is the very beautiful building for the uh, um, South London Gallery and uh, Camberwell School of Art. The director, David Thorpe, took over the gallery um, probably about five years ago and since he took it over they've done some really fantastic shows and um, the art gallery now has quite a, an amazing reputation and it's a wonderful gallery inside and I'm sure most of you know it. David asked me if um, during an earlier period of renovation of the interior I would do a piece of work on the outside and so I did this piece called Golden Crescent. We borrowed sodium floodlights from the council and the council put up the scaffolding for me and we did this moon shape which just simply glowed on the side of this beautiful building and um, it was there through the winter months in It's a piece of work that I felt, I felt a lot of affection for. Um, in the mist, as you drove along uh, Camberwell New Road, um, it was really quite extraordinary and quite eerie. And the other thing was, it only cost £200. Because <laughs> at the end of it, all the materials went back and the piece had disappeared and obviously it, uh, it felt like... Uh, the only thing left was our memories of it and um, the photographs and postcards. In Cambridge there is a theatre which has just been renovated called the Cambridge Arts Theatre and this is a recent piece of work which is a sound and light work on the main stairway that spirals up through the uh, theatre. When you come on the stairway at the bottom you activate little lines of lights and these are little recessed lights in the wall. Unfortunately the photograph just shows them all on but in fact they click on like lines of lights and tiny little uh, clicking sounds are emitted from uh, the uh, skirting boards as you go on up. It starts at red down the bottom and then the LEDs go through green to yellow as you get towards the top. So you get this kind of little melody of these clicks which are in fact little relay switches that follow you up and um, in a busy time it may look a bit like this with a lot of clicking whereas in quieter times it would be a very skeletal and quite sort of delicate sound so it's like the presence of somebody else is, uh, accompanies you or is present um, during your travel up to all the levels of bars and um, different uh, levels within the theatre auditorium. And this is a fabulous photograph because we noticed afterwards there was a cup of coffee sitting there. Are we okay? I seem like I'm doing a sort of shopping list of sculpture here. But um, each time I do a little talk I always just get the slides that sort of come to me so um, I never quite know. Uh, is that one in focus, Jar? Yes, it probably is. I'm now um, going towards a more recent work which opened um, in a gallery in uh, saint fons in um, France which uh, is in a uh, suburb of Lyon and I did five light and sound pieces in the gallery and this is a piece of work called Howling Wolf which originated when I was in Rome because from the British school in Rome you can hear wolves howling from the local zoo from time to time and um, this fascinated me for many reasons so I did the first production of it in Rome whereas in this gallery this is the second production they built this wall for me and it just crashed right through this gallery and right through into a gallery beyond which wasn't lit and two little lines of LEDs were um, embedded on this surface of this wall and deep in that gallery at the back was uh, a soundtrack which Joel if that's possible to put that one on for us and what happens is 
When the wolves howl, these little lights shoot out to the front and then they will recede. in the show is called Frere Jacques, which is a new work, and um, I've, I had recordings made from uh, children in local schools just singing the uh, well-known Frere Jacques round, I think they call it, or ronde in French, I think, round, thank you. Um, the Children sing to a little uh, simple backing track of a guitar or um, uh, I think a piano, violin, whatever. One or two musical instruments all in time. And um, these are put into um, a sound memory system. And when people come into the gallery, they are confronted by this wall. This is the first thing they see. It cuts right across the big main gallery space. And their presence um, activates a sensor which starts a child or a group of children singing the first Frere Jacques, Frere Jacques. And as that happens, these little lights embedded in the wall uh, start to sort of switch out, rather like supermarket doors that sort of open. And if it was just one click, then the child would sing and then the lights would close back up and it would just come to rest. So, but you could walk right around this wall and um, this would be when it's full of the singing, but uh, this is a little sound store at the back. But it's, the wall is just standing there like a sort of a piece of theatrical prop. Shall we play a little bit of it, Joel? There's a CD that goes with the catalogue which um, has uh, some... Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, Sans les matines, sans les matines, sans les matines, ding dang dong. some problem with that tape. <laughs> okay, so that's that little piece there, which um, on the opening night, um, the vernissage, um, it was very nice because all the families and all the children came, and I had the excruciatingly embarrassing experience of lots of these children coming up and wanting me to sign these little um, invitation cards for the vernissage. 
And I stood there wishing I could go through the floor because I just felt so intensely embarrassed. And then I thought, God, you know, I guess sort of pop singers and film stars really dream about this happening to them, but um, it's, uh, it's not for me. But uh, some of, the, uh, some of the, the, the atmosphere in the room is quite sort of spatial and echoey, and um, it's really quite, really quite a moving piece as I hope the Wolverhampton one will be with the children there. Right, where are we now? I've done that, I've done that. Um, but something even more scary is about to happen, uh, I hope, in um, a few weeks' time. Um, I'm working with the architect Robert Barnes um, on a trilogy of pieces called Breathing Out and Breathing In in uh, North Kensington. And you may recognize this building in uh, North Kensington, the Trellick Tower. Um, this, uh, in the trilogy, there are, three <laughs> there are three works in the trilogy, yes. The first one is um, going to be a permanent piece on a building that Robert Barnes has built running along the railway line which is about where David's sitting now in relationship to this picture the main uh, Paddington railway line and um, the second part of the trilogy will be in the lift shaft which, um, which is alongside the building up there and this rather beautiful little sort of lookout tower at the top which was in fact um, I think where the lift shafts, well, is where the lift shafts operate. Um, that piece is destined to be in place for about a year. And the third piece is a much shorter time scale. It's probably an hour or an hour and a half long. And um, it's a live work whereby all the tenants who occupy the uh, apartments in this side of the building are going to be asked to participate in this grand light work which you will be able to see for many miles around on a clear evening. Um, they are, I'm working with three students from the Royal College of Art and uh, another uh, chap who's ex-architect uh, student um, and as a sort of small team of enthusiasts we are meeting, we hope, all the tenants um, this Friday evening for, to discuss with them what this idea is about and to ask for their participation. Because what we hope will happen is that we will give each of them in these apartments uh, some lighting devices, be it torches or uh, spot lamps. We haven't um, finalise yet what, with colour, and um, when the trains go by, which is just outside the front door, um, on Robert Barnes's building, we will count, do be counting in numbers, one, two, three, four, five, whatever, and every time the number changes, all these tenants will have their script, and they will change their colour, so that there is the possibility that the whole front of the building could go through a sequence of colour changes, patterns, or whatever. But what we're doing is, two other artists are working in some local schools with um, children from this area, and uh, just seeing if maybe the children can generate some ideas that would then be fed into this, because obviously it's like a kind of sort of tapestry carpet in a way. So we haven't got a final um, design as such. Um, and uh, we uh, are now um, at that point where we don't know what's going to happen, quite honestly. But um, the whole thing is, in a sense, a kind of test of how people are or are not able to get excited about something um, of this kind of uh, nature. And the, we've discussed many times the possibility of, um, well, we know that certain people won't participate, 
and so there are going to be black holes in this, or there are going to be renegades. Um, so it's never going to be perfect, and uh, as we know, only Allah is perfect anyway, and carpets have to have a mistake in them. And as the Greeks used to say, apparently if you roll a really good piece of sculpture down a hill and uh, bits break off it, when it reaches the bottom, it's a good piece of sculpture, you'll still um, think it's a good piece of sculpture. With things like that to support us, um, we're going to see what happens. And hopefully you will uh, hear more about it. And this is my final piece of work now for this evening, which uh, is called Fate. <coughs> and Fate started in a um, water meadow in uh, a place called Fearing, Fearingbury Manor in Essex. Um, I was invited to participate in an exhibition which uh, was in the grounds of Fearingbury Manor and the garden. Um, at the end of the garden was this very beautiful wood water meadow with a little river and in the water meadow were four cricket bat willow trees and so I decided to do this piece of work using the four cricket bat willow trees to support these canopies of uh, lights, festoon lights and the idea came from visiting uh, a fate in France. And in France, as you will know, during the summer period, there are endless fates. Fate de Blé, fate de Moule, fate de Seed, all those uh, fate de fromage, all those beautiful things that you can go and uh, uh, eat and uh, see all various sort of historic, traditional kinds of um, French um, way of life, reenacted by local people. And Fête du Blé, that happens nearby, is always well attended and they have these great big horses that come along and turn a farm, antique farm machinery and there's a kind of sort of wild energy about the whole thing with uh, dust and uh, plows and uh, what's it going on. So, this uh, work came from there and what it is is just simply this canopy of light and at the end of each line of these lights is a little loudspeaker and these lights appear to flash around in rotation like carousels in a fairground and um, from these little loudspeakers are two mixed soundtracks one is uh, popular Dutch accordion music things like tulips from Amsterdam etc and the other is popular French um, street um, music. And uh, this piece has travelled, it started here and then it went to the Serpentine Gallery and uh, one nice thing that happened there was that two, two people told me that coming into Heathrow in airplanes they could see this piece working at night, um, which I thought was a rather nice sculptural kind of view. And uh, from there it went to Canary Wharf, which was a very weird location in Westbury Circus, and if you know Westbury Circus, it's that roundabout that looks like astroturf, um, which is in fact real grass. Were, uh, this was before Canary Wharf went bust, it went bust soon after my piece went on. Um, and then it finally went to uh, the village where I live in France, which was quite nice because it happened just by the side of the road. and. Um, I would uh, sometimes drive by when it was working and see French people who'd stopped in their cars and they were waltzing underneath it through the night. Um, there's a chance it may go to Amsterdam. Anyway, Joel, we can have the music to play it out, I hope. <laughs>
finished there, Joel. Thank you. <laughs> Fine. Ooh, moving over. Thank you.